<sighs> Hello. And welcome to another episode of the Accordion Revolution Book Club. Uh, my name is Bruce Triggs, and I am the co-host of the Accordion Noir radio show on Co-op Radio, a community radio station in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And uh, we've been broadcasting that show weekly since 2006, so that's almost uh, well, about 13 and a half years. And during that time, I wrote a book. Accordion Revolution, the people's history of the accordion from the Industrial Revolution to rock and roll. And uh, there there was a possibility as we did our radio show, a lot of the music is is uh, after you know the invention of rock and roll, modern music of all kinds, classical music, jazz, punk rock, uh, all kinds of music from around the world. Um, and as I wrote the book, it grew until it was quite large, several hundred pages, 300 and almost 400 pages, uh, uh, but readable, not boring pages. That was the rule. Make the book not boring. Um, and uh, it, it, it grew, and then as that was happening, it also shrunk. So it has less to do with uh, modern music and more to do with that history and I also limited it to North America because um, there was too many other genres around the world that were wonderful but it would have taken me years and years more to have to learn about all those as it was I ran into whole genres of music in North America that I had to learn about that I didn't know about before I started writing the book and um, I ended up doing sort of beginner's work on those. Hopefully I can pass that on so other people will feel ready to uh, dip into those musics. Um, or maybe if they know about those, they can correct any of my mistakes and hopefully tap in and hear some familiar names and be entertained by what I was able to gather. Um, let's see. Again, the, the book, I, I wrote it to be useful uh, and informative, lots of uh, stories in there, but definitely leaning towards being entertaining uh, and uh, interesting rather than just an academic work. Um, I did footnote just about everything in the book. There's footnotes for almost every, certainly every paragraph in the book. Um, and uh, it ended up what, what would have been about 200 extra pages of footnotes. So I have an annotated uh, text and uh, I keep saying in the book I say, and I, I keep saying that I'm gonna figure out a way to make that available so everybody can see that annotation if you're into it. Um, and so it could inspire more research where other people will come and, and uh, follow up on the stories that I was only able to learn a little bit, share a little bit about. But uh, today, my radio co-host is uh, putting together the Vancouver Car Free Day uh, Accordion Noir Stage is an annual event. Um, and uh, he is putting together a concert with musicians virtually performing from all over Canada, which is awesome. And uh, asked me maybe if there's a need to fill time whether I could do a reading. So I'm gonna do a little reading of a chapter on the African-American accordion, which is almost entirely unknown uh, tradition. Um, and that is uh, just one that it, it's sort of self-inclusive uh, um, and I think really interesting and a valuable contribution um, to uh, to the world of folk music and certainly accordion history um, and black music history. So I'm going to talk about that and um, th I should just get going on that. If you're interested, I do have an Etsy shop. Uh, if you type in accordion revolution on on the your computer or whatever, it'll come up. And uh, there are copies of the book. There's copies of this swanky pin of a flaming accordion, um, which is 
modeled after Rosie here's tattoo. You can see her little tattoo there. When uh, the book design was happening, um, we worked together and uh, the, the idea of using that motif of the flaming accordion sacred heart image um, ended up being a, a really fun one for for the book um, and uh, and it got used in the section headings in the book which is really f cool and then I made the pins out of it so those pins are available online at, at accordion revolution there's an Etsy shop link there and that's fun so that's there that's done uh, oh, of course, the other thing we have there is, is uh, my bookmark, is the famous One Less Guitar stickers are also available uh, on there. So, that said, there you go, it's my plug. Accordion Revolution. History of the Accordion in North America. I tried to follow pretty much all the... I missed only a couple. I didn't get Basque music and I didn't get a lot of the Caribbean music. Um, uh, so that's next book uh, but this book it tried to cover all the music in North America that led up to sort of modern accordion so if people are into klezmer music now if people are into zydeco Cajun Irish music that's a, a sort of the entree to a lot of people in addition to polka and jazz and uh, a big chapter on country western accordion that almost nobody knows was a pretty major part of country music in the 1930s and especially in the 40s uh, and on into the 50s. There was, you know, if you were a country band in the 40s, there was a, you know, 50-50 chance you had an accordionist in the band. So that was a really fun chapter. But uh, that comes in, uh, I did lots of ethnic musics, different kinds, and then when I got to this this is the uh, American Wheeze. This is a tune by 16 Horsepower uh, that I stole. Um, <laughs> and uh, I wrote it as an alternative prehistory of rock. Rock and roll is often said to be sort of uh, like black music and white music and it all came together. And there's tons of Latino music that was influential there with the guitar styles, especially. Um, and that that mixture led to rock and roll. So I was like, okay, so what's the accordion angle? If if there was rock and roll bands that all had accordion, where would that have come from? And what's missing in the, the rock and roll accordion history? So uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna start off here and read you the first chapter. I start with the African-American accordion. The next chapter is the country music accordion. And the last one is the folk revival uh, in the rock and roll chapter. I, I think that the American folk revival groups like the Kingston Trio leading up to uh, uh, Joan Baez and, and Bob Dylan were the other kind of feed into modern rock music. Um, and uh, and uh, the folk revival left out the accordion mostly, which is used it in a lot of places, but not here. So, let's get started, see what happens with the African-American accordion, and why don't we see a lot of that. <coughs> Most of the written history of North American pop music was crafted amidst the extreme anti-accordion stereotypes of the late 20th century. The stage for this was set by preservationists as early as the late 1800s, who originally planted the idea that vernacular culture was worthy of attention. These early thinkers not only romanticized pre-industrial folk music, but also set it up in opposition to degenerate modern culture. Popular accordions were seen as more corrupted than other instruments, regardless of how long they'd been part of local traditions. Never mind whether they'd been purchased from the same mail-order catalogs as banjos or guitars, Misguided by what writer Benjamin Fleeling called a cult of authenticity, folk enthusiasts ended up distorting the past while seeking to preserve it. Later chroniclers inherited this rejection of, of the accordion. Despite these prejudices, though, accordions and other impurities connected and enriched the journey of white, black, and other ethnic musics that together fed into the great hybrid rock and roll. It's easy to find antique accordions that predate 
very what am I saying here? Ah, it's easy to find antique accordions that predate every country or blues record we now consider roots music. At various times over the last hundred years, the instrument's been played by African Americans, country musicians, and the various folks who inspired the folk revival. Let's follow them to their roots. Chapter 13, African Americans played the blues I blew my line. This is my favorite line in the book, favorite title. African Americans played accordion before they played the blues. That was a good day writing when I came up with that line. We think of roots music as being the deepest roots. But African American blues, for instance, sprang from more recent origins than is commonly assumed. Blues music developed in various parts of the South around the turn of the last century and spread widely among African Americans in the decades before the Great Depression. But what came before the blues? No answer comes to mind, because the blues and gospel were among the earliest African American music to be widely recorded. Before that, there's almost nothing to hear. Of course, free and enslaved African Americans made music for hundreds of years before they were recorded, and by the 1850s, some of them had taken up accordions. Before the Civil War, music training, instruments, and musicians were purchased by slave owners for their households. Some owners allowed enslaved musicians to play for other slaves as a means of pacification. Frederick Douglass wrote that dances, frolics, and holidays were among the most effective means in the hands of slaveholders of keeping down the spirit of insurrection. A hint of how slaves' desires conflicted with owners is revealed by the fact that much of the documentation about black musicians comes from escaped slave notices that told of these seeking freedom. Rewards were offered that specifically mentioned people taking flight who read music and played or even built fiddles. The prices, prices slaveholders were willing to pay for musicians is clear from the case of Solomon Northup, a free black musician kidnapped from New York and forced into slavery in Louisiana. Northup wrote his famous memoir, Twelve Years a Slave, after regaining his freedom in 1853. Emancipated slaves remembered a great number of blacks playing fiddle, banjo, and percussion, as well as handmade reed pipes called quills. Robert Winant's remarkable tally of ex-slave narratives counted 205 fiddles, 106 banjos, and 30 quills. Only 15 guitars were mentioned, and there were six accordions. The African-American accordion became more popular later, between 1880 and 1910, well after the antebellum era were called by former slaves. There had always been African-inspired versions of fiddles, banjos, and other popular instruments, accordions, and I gotta edit this to add harmonicas also, their cousins, became the first major African-American instruments that had no handmade precedent. Expensive imported accordions were initially confined to upper-class parlors, but once they became more affordable, mass-produced free reed instruments blossomed. Accordions were first widely encountered in America in the hands of black-faced minstrels. See Chapter 3. They started the story of American pop music starts with black-faced minstrels, and that's where the first accordions came from. At the same time, Urban blacks were playing accordions in cities like New Orleans. See Chapter 6, Jazzing the Accordion. The original jazz musicians were accordionists. And began developing their own tradition. English-speaking African American accordionists emerged in the 1860s and were popular from emancipation until the advent of the blues in the early 20th century. I didn't mention that, but in case you didn't... He, uh, don't read the earlier. If you didn't read the earlier chapters, uh, jazzing the accordion, Buddy Bolton, who's sort of the godfather of jazz, he played accordion as a kid. Just to let you know. In the years after the Civil War, many rural African Americans musicians performed for local social dances. 
fiddles predominated, along with other instruments, including banjos, guitars, and the late coming accordions. The music these string bands played was similar to what we associate with square dances or old time country or barn dances. Many early country musicians recalled blacks who played the style that was eventually called hillbilly music. Despite how widespread and influential their tradition was, very few black string bands recorded and even fewer black accordionists. The earliest African-American accordionist to make an audio recording was Walter Rhodes, who released a single disc in 1927. Rhodes was mostly ignored by customers and pretty much everybody else until 60 years later when researcher Jared Snyder called a famous folklorist and asked if there were other black accordionists besides Rhodes. Jared says, the answer I got was a definitive no. Not maybe, not there's much work to be done. And the finality of that answer just struck me as so wrong. And as Schneider, who I gotta say, shout out to Jared Snyder, he did most of the work on recovering the history of this African American tradition. Without Jared Snyder's work, we wouldn't know pretty much everything that's in this book here. Uh, and there's a couple of other people who I name, but Jared is really the the root, and he's got other. Uh, research and such. If you're interested, let me know and I can uh, hook you up with Jared Snyder's other articles on this. And and uh, de definitely if you get a hold of Jared, then uh, tell him he's got to finish his book on this uh, topic because I want to read it. As Jared went on to discover, Rhodes was not the only African-American accordionist. The trouble was that by the time recording began, the instrument was fading. Most of the black accordionists who recorded were in their 70s or 80s, years after their playing was in demand. The few recordings we have of early African-American accordion can all be listened to in a single afternoon. They only hint, they only hint, at a century of parties, dances, and church meetings where the instrument flourished. The last recordings of elderly black accordions were made in Virginia in 1980. These brought an end to the tradition. As far as we know, the music was never passed on. Why, then, is this forgotten thread of American music significant? For one thing, blacks played accordions during one of the most dire periods in African American history. After the fleeting hope of reconstruction, racism continued to corrupt much of the United States between 1890 and 1940, prolonging the torture of slavery until the middle of the 20th century and beyond. The African American accordion bloomed between 1880 and 1910, perhaps the harshest years suffered by African Americans after slavery. In the North and South, thousands of blacks were lynched by white mobs, one every three days between 1860 and 1890. The rise of the Ku Klux Klan and other white supremacist groups compounded the era's Jim Crow segregation laws that denied African Americans basic human rights. In this time of crisis, few took notice of black string bands and accordionists. Black and white scholars, who later brought attention to African Americans' gospel and blues, largely passed over these older styles, leaving us haunted by musical phantoms, sounds we can never recover. This is how cultural memory is extinguished. <clears throat> we got a picture here. According to us on the cusp of the blues, Lead Belly and his Windjammer. Huddy Ledbetter, known as Lead Belly, was the greatest recorded example of the early African American accordion. He was also among the last. Born in 1889 in Cattle Parish, Northwest Louisiana, he grew up across the state line in Northeast Texas. When he was seven years old, his uncle Terrell came home from early morning from nearby morning sport and gave the boy his first instrument a small diatonic accordion. Leadbelly's neighbors called them wind jammers, and in the early 1900s, they played them at local frolics and soupy jump dances. 
Leadbelly remembered playing his accordion at dances in the majority black region where he grew up when there was no white man for 20 miles. Old dances were still derived from the cotillions of the years of slavery. His recording, Laura, reflects the poetic dance calling instructions that blacks developed for the, these kind of European country dances. Take your partner, skip on down the line. The few brief accordion records he left behind would likely have been greatly expanded when musicians played dances lasting into the early hours of the morning. Even when Lead Belly twice recorded the ballad John Hardy on accordion, his relentless bass rhythm would have sustained dancers. All of Lead Belly's accordion recordings have been have him performing solo, so we miss any ensemble elements that might have been common in his childhood. His foot keeps rhythm in his dance pieces, but instruments could have included anything from padding, hand percussion, especially if there were no other instruments, to scraper sticks on the teeth of an animal's jawbone, as recalled in Leadbelly's Cornbread Rough. Jawbone eat, jawbone talk, jawbone gonna eat with a knife and fork. Earlier house dances might have had a pair of fiddles and perhaps a banjo. Accordions were attractive in these situations because they were loud enough to replace one or both fiddles. As Lead Belly grew up, guitars would take over for the banjo, and when blues came to dominate, guitars and pianos replaced almost all the old string band instruments. It's worth noting that Lead Belly's rural English language tradition was distinct from French-speaking Black Creole or Cajun accordion players to the south. Unfortunately, Lead Belly's English frolic dancing faded with the onset of the 20th century. Creole and Cajun accordion players managed to keep their unique French repertoire despite the changes in American music, they call it that, American music, around them. By the time Lead Belly was a teenager, he had moved to Dallas, where he backed blues legend Blind Lemon Jefferson. He played less and less accordion, and then bought a Mexican 12-string guitar, and for the rest of his career, Leadbelly was known as a guitarist. Years after he'd left his childhood squash box behind, squash box, Leadbelly returned to it of his own accord. He may have been nostalgic for the songs of his youth, or perhaps he was inspired by the growing popularity of the accordion in the 1940s. His style had little to do with the Andrews Sisters' Beer Bell Polka, but we can't discard the idea he was thinking about broadening his audience. He was looking for some success there. <coughs> Pardon me. Unfortunately, few of his comrades in the early folk revival seem to have showed any curiosity about his accordion. Even Sis Cunningham, who played piano accordion in the Almanac Singers with Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, doesn't mention Lead Belly's Windjammer in her biography. No one seems to have asked about this old-fashioned accordionist amongst the crowd of guitar and banjo players trying to popularize folk music. One of the more than 150... That's not right. Out of the more than 150 Lead Belly recordings, we have five where he played his accordion. Twelve minutes total from late in his career are the only representation of the first music he ever played. One piece, Suki Jump, lasts barely a minute before it cuts off. We can only imagine if he had recorded without the time limitations of 78 RPM records and reproduced something like the hours-long dances of his childhood. As it is, these fragments take us back to the threshold of the last century a grim time for African Americans when entertainment was precious and their music was dramatically changing. I'm going to cause, pause to cough here and have a little drink from my uh, accordion dude. This is uh, a gift from my co-host Rowan, um, which I think he might have got from his mom or, 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 or mother-in-law. Anyways, uh, uh, I was able to use this was my companion for the writing of the whole book there. Um, uh, and uh, kept me going. <clears throat> we'll see. Walter Rhodes, Leaving Home Blues. Over the history of more than 5,000 race records, 
the only commercial blues recording by an English-speaking African-American accordionist was a single disc by Walter Rhodes in 1927. The Crowing Rooster, Leaving Home Blues, which you can get on YouTube nowadays and stuff, so jump over there. If we had little links in the corner, I would put that on here somewhere. Rhodes is significant because he was among the earliest Mississippi Delta blues singers with any instrument to record. He was also one of the oldest. The recordings contrast his fading accordion technique with the fine blues guitar accompaniment by Mylan and Richard Harney. They were reportedly paired up to balance Rhodes' vocalists vocals with old country re- let me start again here these youngsters they're messing me up coming in on the old accordionist they were reportedly paired up to balance Rhodes vocals and old country racket with the guitarists who lacked a singer Rhodes accordion struggles with uh, through the two slow blues numbers supported by the Harney's more agile guitar Rhodes bass and melody hands <clears throat> Rhodes bass and melody hands repeated simple phrases that conflict with the harmony of the tune, and he plainly was unable to match the creative support the other instruments offered. Rhodes never recorded again, and he's said to have been killed years later when struck by lightning. <clears throat> Blind Jesse Harris, Delta Accordion. Two years after Rhodes recorded, John Lomax spent an afternoon in 1937 with an elderly Mississippi accordionist blind Jesse Harris. Without commercial studio constraints, Harris was able to play a wider variety of tunes than Rose, including blues and ballads and dance tunes. The recordings are quite rough, with Harris's stomping foot often threatening to overwhelm the proceedings, but together he and Rhodes represent the only audible examples of the Mississippi accordion as it existed at the advent of the blues. Significantly, they each learned to play in the 1890s, near the birthplace of some of the most important later blues performers. The accordionists were, however, the last of their kind, because we know of no young black musicians who took the, the instrument in their wake. The accordion failed the blues. At the dawn of the 20th century, the accordion failed black musicians. Blues innovations challenged the players of many instruments, pianos, guitarists, and other chromatic instrument, instrumentalists mastered novel blues scales, guitars and harmonicas added slurred or bent notes to emulate blues vocals, early accordionists could do none of these things. The positive attributes of African American squash box accordions, cheapness, portability, and volume, were assets in the roadhouses or street corners where the blues got started, but these positives didn't outweigh early accordions' many negatives when faced with the blues. <coughs> the central problem with most early accordions was their limitation to playing certain scales. If you see an accordion, they, you look at them, they got a row of buttons, and it'll be one key. It's like a harmonica, each one is in one key. Accordionists with simple 10 button design suited many European folk musics, but playing most basic blues was a challenge. Players might fake a blues tune by leaving out notes that their accordion lacked, but complete melodies and blues chord regressions were often impossible. The introduction in the early 1900s of Hawaii's endlessly expressive slide guitar added to the inadequacies that beset black accordions. Harmonica players could alter notes to achieve blue scales and flavor, but a hundred years later, accordionists still lacked this pitch-bending expressiveness. The bass side of early accordions compounded their inadequacy. Whereas guitarists could play blues melodies while harmonizing bass and chordal accompaniment, the accordionists were sometimes limited to as few as two bass buttons and often had to disregard harmony and use them only for atonal rhythms. More capable Stradella bass systems remained unavailable or unaffordable, and blues players discarded the instrument. The disappearance of the African American accordion coincided with the rise of piano in black, gospel, blues, and jazz. 
as covered in our discussion of jazz accordion, pianos were available most everywhere. Bars, brothels, hotels, clubs, and recording studios. They could even be rolled out onto street corners. And the smallest accordion was a burden compared to a piano already installed at the musician's destination, although the on-site piano might well be out of tune. In the stores and catalogs of the early 20th century, button accordions cost around the same as guitars and fiddles, but when piano accordions with chromatic scales and full bass accompaniment became available, they were much more expensive than simple instruments like the old button boxes. Facing the cost of quality accordions, blues and jazz players were propelled towards the piano bench. African American accordions and cheap banjo and string bands vanished in the first decades of the 20th century. Without young protégés and with few other outlets, accordionist, banjo, and fiddle players became associated with rural backwardness and the stereotypes of minstrelsy. When black accordions didn't travel north in the Great Migration, the style lost any hope of reaching modern ears. <clears throat> A number of fa famed jazz and blues musicians are known to have accompanied accordionists or played accordion themselves before switching to other instruments. Delta blues man Big Joe Williams fondly remembered his grandfather, Burt Logan, playing fiddle and accordion at house dancers. William, moreover, claimed his grandfather was one of the best musicians he ever heard. Charlie Patton, who became tremendously influential in the blues revival, traveled and played with accordionist Homer Lewis in his younger days. Patton made about 50 recordings, half of which were blues. The remainder were an eclectic variety of music that coexisted with the development of the blues. He unfortunately never recorded with Lewis or other accordionists who might have excelled at this earlier material. Almost nothing is known about a certain Joe Harper who played accordion in Hazelhurst, Mississippi in about 1900, supporting guitarist Ike Zimmerman. The only reason we know Homer's name <coughs> is that Zimmerman became the guitar tutor for a young Robert Johnson. Johnson, of course, went on to make a series of recordings, died young, and was largely forgotten, until he helped inspire the white 1960s blues guitar revival. Neither Zimmerman nor his accordionist Harper, Joe Harper, accordion Joe, ever recorded, and they slipped away quietly with no revival. Significant blues players overlapped again with the old accordion tradition with another appearance of the tantalizingly obscure Homer Lewis. Besides playing with Charlie Patton, Lewis played accordion with Patton's apprentice, a young guitarist and harmonica player, Chester Burnett, Chester Burnett who made a name for himself as Howlin' Wolf. After moving to Chicago, Wolf joined others in plugging in and electrifying the blues. The chief of his contemporaries was a guitarist vocalist Muddy Waters, born McKinley A. Morganfield, who as a child growing up in Isquana County, Mississippi, played harmonica and an old broken accordion. By the time Waters was recorded on his front porch in 1941 by John Work and Alan Lomax, He'd long given up the instrument, and he earned his fame through his guitar. The list of blues musicians who had experiences with early accordion players is fragmented, because so few were ever asked. Besides Muddy Waters and Lead Belly, famous bluesmen who played accordion in their childhoods included Big Joe Williams, who learned from his grandfather, and 12 string guitarist Blind Willie McIntell. The connection of these pioneers of blues and folk music to accordions has been treated as a footnote at best. The Encyclopedia of the Blues says, Muddy Waters started on a beat-up button accordion. That is almost all they've known about Chicago's blues and its history with the instrument. Once artists picked up guitars, the accordion was dispensed with. Lead Belly was the only player who returned to the instrument with affection later in his life. After the coming of the blues, no young players we know of took up accordions, and the African-American windjammer faded and died. When the blues scale became a mandatory part of American music, the fateful lack of flu critical buttons cost the accordion its place in nearly half a century of American music. <clears throat> sacred black accordion. African-American accordions probably lasted longest in church. 
It is thought unbecoming for a church member to play the violin, if not actually an audacious communication with Satan himself, but it involves neither deadly sin nor any spiritual risk whatever to play the accordion, or the lap organ, as they call it, read an item in the Boston Evening Transcript in 1892. African Americans have played accordions at secular dances since the late 1800s. At the same time, these lap organs were used for sacred music. I should say there's another instrument, which I haven't got it right here, but I think it's called a lap organ, which is really weird. It's like a harmonium. You know, in Indian music, they have those instruments where they kind of do the, uh, there's a bellows on the back of it, and then the other hand, they play a keyboard. The Irish band Lancome right now, or like Shaking the World, they play one of those with the thing, and, and uh, Grady Pete plays it with her foot while they're doing other stuff. It's awesome. Check it out. Um, but uh, so there's those harmoniums with the thing that's in the in the front there like this. But there there was these uh, tabletop organs that, if you look up pictures of it, um, they were like like instead of having the instrument and a keyboard and little bellows in the back, you would do this with. It was like they had a keyboard on the front here, and the whole top with the keyboard would kind of go like this and they had a big bellows down here I have no idea how you play the thing while you were shaking it like this to make the bellows sound but maybe I don't know if they had those as well in this state but lap organ for an accordion seems maybe definitely they had those in these churches that's an aside may have been a footnote I don't know but uh, <clears throat> let's see Lap organs were used for sacred music. Unlike the unsavory fiddles, stigma-free accordions were easily adopted for playing in church or respectable homes. Guitarist John Cannon, who married the sister of blues icon Charlie Patton in 1904, stopped playing all but accordion in support of his religion. John Jackson of Rappahannock, Virginia, don't know if I'm saying that right, attested that his mother played only spirituals on the accordion, so pieces as Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, and I Shall Not Be Moved. Flora Moulton from Louisa County, Virginia, who played accordion before switching to guitar, remembered her father, a Baptist minister, who felt comfortable playing spirituals on the accordion and apparently disapproved of his fellow accordionists in the area who mixed the spiritual with the secular. Not everyone made such distinctions. Burt Logan, grandfather of blues guitarist Big Joe Williams, played fiddle tunes on the accordion, but also at church, as a church deacon seems to have been among those performers who could reconcile singing spirituals and performing secular music. Similarly, Emily Jackson, the mother of South Carolina medicine show harmonica player Peg Leg Sam, was remembered as a fine player of both sacred and secular music on accordion and organ. Gospel music and the blues developed as close musical cousins. Gospel piano brought the same technical obstacles that button accordions faced with blues guitars. By the mid-1920s, accordions had been almost completely silenced in black churches. Very few survivors remained unrecorded and largely unnoticed. In 1972, Sister Sadie B. Sadlers, who played in her church in Saw, Mississippi, was photographed with her button accordion. I think she also had a piano accordion like sitting on her bed when they took that picture there. She may have been the last survivor of the black accordion tradition in the state of Mississippi. The instrument did live on as a sacred instrument in scattered areas. Years after the coming of gospel, a few auto recording, audio recordings were made of sacred African-American accordions, such as those harkening back to the 19th century's button box. The last known recordings of English-language black diatonic button accordions were made by folklorist Kip Lornell in 1981. The Toms family singers in Piney River, Virginia, were a unison choir with a dozen members of different ages supported by patriarch Walter Toms Jr. playing an old two-row button accordion. His bass rhythm rhythm and rough melody seems unassuming until you realize it was the fading echo of button accordions that played for African-American churches and dance floors since the 1880s. And that was in 1981, so 100 years worth of tradition right there. 
The black button accordion fell into obscurity, but piano accordions still occasionally turned up playing African-American sacred music. The instrument was especially suited for open-air street preaching, and that's where folklorists encountered several great performers. Blind Connie Williams, who was born in 1915, was a lively street singer who played guitar and piano accordion, was recorded in Philadelphia in 1961. Originally from Florida in the 1930s, he played with fame, blues, and gospel guitars, Reverend Gary Davis in New York. Thirty years later, Williams' repertoire included blues and sacred songs on guitar, but only spiritual numbers on the accordion. He claimed the police harassed him less if he sang religious songs, and he preferred the accordion because it was less work to play loud. As a child, he learned music at the Florida School for the Deaf and Blind, Ray Charles' alma mater, but no one seems to have asked Williams if he played the older button box as well as the newer piano accordion. Besides his one soulful recording session, little is known about him, even when or where he died. Representing a slightly younger generation, Clarence Clay and William Scott sang on the streets of Philadelphia in the 1950s and 60s. <clears throat> Clay played piano accordion and harmonized gospel songs with Scott. Born in the 1920s, the duo may have been playing this on the streets of Philadelphia for a decade when they recorded their 1963 album, The Blues of Clarence Clay and William Scott, The New Gospel Keys, for folk researcher Pete, Willing, Pete Welding's Testament record label. Clay's weaving, almost droning accordion combines with the doer's row raw counterpoint to create a stirring resonance one can only hope was appreciated and on Philadelphia street corners. Along with Blind Connolly Williams, Clay and Scott's gritty glory fulfilled the promise of the accordion as an instrument that took music to the people while lifting the spirits. If you get a chance, check out on YouTube or whatever, get the record, uh, Clarence Clay and William Scott. This is just amazing, roaring stuff. Fantastic recordings. Father Augustine John Tolton on a sacred path. Stepping back from the gospel tradition, according as John Tolton was in, born in 1854 and died in 1897, he was the first recognized black Catholic priest in America. He was born in Missouri into an enslaved family. And when Tolton was eight, he and his family escaped their Catholic slaveholders and fled into Illinois and his father died fighting for the Union Army. After he applied to and rejected, was rejected by U.S. seminaries, Tolton studied for the priesthood in Rome and was ordained in 1886. He wanted to serve in Africa, but was ordered to return to the U.S. He became known for his sermons, his singing, and for the accordion that a fellow seminarian had taught him to play. This was probably let me interject, probably one of the older style French accordions that they had back then. They were kind of like a higher class one that then was later replaced by the little button accordions that we were talking about earlier. <clears throat> As the lone black priest, he faced prejudice and isolation and would often read or play hymns on his accordion long into the night. Working tirelessly to increase his flock, he died in a Chicago heat wave at age 43. Tolkien's been proposed for canonization for his role challenging discrimination. Assuming success, he'll be the first sainted accordionist from the United States. He's, he, apparently, he's like gone through all the steps towards sainthood, except like he's, his paperwork's on the Pope, Pope's desk now. Um, and his story is really interesting. He's got some great stories. As I recall, there's one about a uh, uh, white young woman who wanted to marry her boyfriend and the families didn't want him to do it and so they talked to all the priests in town to make it so no one would marry him so they went across town to the black priest and he was the only one who would talk to him and he married them so that that was one of the things he didn't make friends with the white people there but uh integrated accordion in the south <clears throat> Thanks to the work of Jared Snyder and a few others, Kip Lornell being one, we have an outline of the African American accordion, but information about rural white players in the South remains scarce. 
What's known is that accordions were part of the old-time fiddle dances where musicians of different races played together on occasion. The very few recordings we have of European-American button box players seem closely related to the African-American style. Somewhere in here, I don't know if I mention it, but there's a there's a reference to people saying that in some regions only the blacks played accordion, like the white people didn't. But was there an unexplored southern white old-time accordion tradition? Were button box players like Melissa Vandiver Monroe, who was the mother of bluegrass founder Bill Monroe, part of a wider southern accordion style? She played fiddle and accordion, and... Like, basically nobody ever asked Bill Monroe what kind of accordion his mom played. Uh, the instrument may have been rare, and it may not have fit the stereotypes of hillbilly music that record scouts wanted. Several elderly white accordionists were, however, recorded by folklorists over a span of decades, indicating that tradition may have persisted in out-of-the-way places. Emmett Valentine was a white accordionist from Centerville, North Carolina. He was born in 1891. He'd given up playing for years, but his daughter gave him an accordion in 1971, and he recorded an hour's worth of old-time and religious tunes that seemed closely related to African-American accordionists from the region. Similarly, Reed Eddy and John Davis were a mixed-race accordion duo that recorded religious music in Buckingham County, Virginia in the late uh, as late as 1986. These old men brought together remarkable strands of music history that remain almost entirely unexplored. The silencing of the black accordion. Record companies began profiting from the work of black artists in the 1920s, but accordions were not part of the sales strategy. Producers focused on African-American gospel, jazz, and blues players turning away old-time string bands, black fiddlers, banjo players, and the occasional accordionist. As Elijah Wald has said, in a less race-conscious world, black fiddlers and white blues singers might have been regarded as forming a single southern continuum. To make things worse, non-commercial field recordings also neglected black accordionists. Folkloric song catchers too often assumed accordions were recent interlopers, and ironically, they sought out more modern blues stylings instead. Thinking they were plumbing the roots of African American culture, they bypassed an instrument that had been played by Southern blacks since the time of slavery. Race records erasure. We're going to go through both of those here the race and then the folklore. The record industry sold millions of blues, jazz, and gospel records to what they called the race market during the pre-depression 1920s. Race records were named to appeal to the pride of black people striving for a better future. Being a race man or woman in the early 20th century implied that you were part of the struggle against the insults of racism. The new commercial record companies didn't necessarily care about that. They were interested in black dollars. In those same early recording years, ethnic record labels were capturing the attention of niche markets in Irish, Polish, Yiddish, and Italian, and other communities. Some, producing, some produced artists who ascended to become stars, but during the rise of the accordion in mainstream music, almost no black examples were recorded. And there were certainly no, well, no well-known black accordion stars. The coming of the recording industry drastically changed music in the southern United States. Prior to the 1920s especially, black bands might play for white audiences, and white songs were popular with black musicians. Integration of players, or even audiences, was not unknown. Musical influences flowed back and forth across still very significant racial barriers. Basically, black and white players would both play whatever music was fashionable. Tin Pan Alley, minstrel tunes, folk tunes, and dance numbers. Smart musicians prepared for any request, whether for ballads that were 100 years old or new songs based on recent disasters and events. Beginning in the 1920s, record company sales branches decided they wanted boundaries. In effect, record stores invented genres in order to funnel customers towards the music they thought was most likely to buy. Companies divided Southern music based on race. 
blacks would purchase race records, while white customers were directed to hillbilly music. Despite the fact that hillbilly music was made by both races, African Americans' fiddles, banjo players, and accordionists were marketed out of history. In the words of recent commentary Eric Brightwell, black hillbilly musicians quietly learned some other tunes if they hoped to cut music for anyone besides field recorders and ethnomusicologists. This market-driven purge of non-black instru- non-blues instruments from black music drove the African American corner accordion into obscurity. Let me go for another drink here from my uh, Folklorists and Black Accordion Folk historians might have acknowledged black accordionists who had been locked out by record companies. It had never happened. Initially, in fact, many nationalist folklorists didn't appreciate African music at all. They slowly changed as progressive values spread. By the 1960s, researchers were tracking down old musicians based on commercial records from the 1920s and 30s, but they often missed traditions that weren't captured on the 78 records. Mention of accordions and accordionists were repeatedly overlooked by writers and researchers. Bill Greensmith, in his excellent biography of blues guitarist Henry Townsend, mentioned that Townsend's father had played accordion in Missouri in the early 1900s. He could do a lick or two on guitar, but he played an accordion. He played blues, something like Clifton Chenier. But back then, that word wasn't used, blues. I never heard that word used. We called them reels back then. This was a glimpse into the music that predated the blues. But follow-up questions didn't follow. Did Townsend Father play button accordion? Were there other accordionists around? What was the difference between reels and blues? After Townsend died in 2006, there was no one left to ask. Blues artists were seldom asked about the music they heard when they were young. Muddy Waters might have told what kind of accordion he had as a child, or who he remembered playing them. Howlin' Wolf might have recalled Homer Lewis and how the accordion sounded behind Charlie Patton's guitar. In separate interviews, bluesmen Big Joe Williams, Casey Douglas, Jim Brewer, and Eli Owen, all born between 1900 and 1921, mentioned older relatives who played accordions, and in many cases taught them their first music. These black accordionists faded in the early 20th century, but the death of the tradition was not inevitable. Between the initial decline and the very last known player, 60 years of possible interviews and recordings were missed. Surviving black accordionists could have played in the 1960s folk festivals, but they remained undiscovered. The Windjammer Century Black accordionists and string bands they were part of exist largely as inaudible ghosts today. Dances played by slaves for their owner's entertainment, marches of black soldiers through the Civil War, square dance calls by freed blacks during the shifting racial grounds of Reconstruction, and struggling generations of black musicians trying to accommodate the challenge of the blues amidst the terror of Jim Crow. In 1981, in a small community of Macy's Mill in Nelson County, Virginia, folklorist Kip Lornell visited with three accordionists. Frank and John Tolliver and Hiawatha Giles were probably the last English-speaking African-American accordionists ever recorded. For younger family members, their music must have seemed a world apart. Three old men with their funny songs and accordions. But the elders carried the echoes of a century. The black accordion had begun its slow fade back when the blues arose, but it survived in rural pockets through the coming of jazz, R&B, rock, and soul. But after the men played and joked that afternoon in Virginia, when no young person picked up the old instruments, the African-American accordion tradition was silenced. Okay, um, 
I guess I'll say uh, for the final thing that, uh, again, thank you for being here for long reading from my book, Accordion Revolution. And uh, if you want to go to the website, Accordion Revolution uh, website on there, uh, you can search and uh, the book's available in um, all the regular places on my Accordion Revolution site. There's a big list of alternatives to that one book website that everyone goes to. Um, if you have read it, we appreciate reviews. If you want to put a review on Amazon or Goodreads or any of those places, a lot of people check those and then don't buy from Amazon. Uh, buy from your local bookstore or order it through your local bookshop. There's a ebook version, which is really cheap. It's like 10 bucks. Uh, that's available all over the place. You could request the book at your local library. That would be super helpful. I, uh, I always wanted the book to be available widely through libraries. Uh, I, uh, I credit the Vancouver Public Library as uh, 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 my research, unofficial research assistant through the book. We did an awful lot of interlibrary loans coming through the Vancouver Library. I'm sure they were mystified by what all these books were. But uh, really appreciate everybody checking us out. If you are here for the Accordion Noir stage, um, uh, uh, thanks for us. Thanks for Car Free Day and Sam and the other folks at Car Free Day for taking us on there. And uh, look forward to the Accordion Noir Festival in the fall. My co-host of the Accordion Noir show, Rowan, is trying to pull that together, hoping to get international artists that we could never afford to actually have transport all the way here. So that should be a lot of fun in the fall. And we're always, on every Wednesday night, the Accordion Noir show is uh, live, or nowadays pre-recorded, uh, and broadcast on Vancouver's co-op radio, local community radio station, and uh, always looking for, for support for that project, for the Accordion Noir show and co-op radio. Um, and that's been a, a great gift that uh, has basically produced this book, and all the other work we've done here through that radio show. We're on every Wednesday night and also available uh, on the podcast and the website to connect with the podcast links are all on accordionuprising.org. So that's a, a worthwhile place to check out uh, occasional blog posts. And my co-host Rowan is, again, uh, filing all our shows on there. So you can check out them. Um, we got a, about... Uh, 13 years worth of episodes if, if you're dying for an accordion fix you can go on there and find a lot of stuff and we always publish the the uh, playlists on the website there with links to all the musicians contact information so you can go and directly support the musicians and we definitely suggest you go and check out the rest of their records because we're only playing like one song's worth and I have uh 20,000 accordion tracks on on my uh, in my collection and we went the first 6 years I think without repeating a track on the radio show so there's there's lots more material out there and whole albums based on you know the the good records that we play there's many more out there so definitely support those artists especially in these times of struggle for everybody um and, uh, you know, if, if you go to the uh, Accordion Revolution site, you can uh, uh, check out the uh, materials there. I'm working on getting t-shirts. I got this one. My family gave me this shirt. I gotta stand up here. Isn't that great? That's a good looking shirt, yeah. And uh, I'm hoping to get these. I'm waiting and, and we're gonna get these hopefully in the Accordion Revolution um, book store and and shop there and we have the little flamey pins these hot flamey pins and one less guitar stickers those are good stuff and what else we got in there oh we got the uh, little buttons this is the last thing these are the buttons uh, uh, we worked on Woody Guthrie used to have his guitar that said uh, back in World War II I always assume it was taken from like a military uh, uh, 
machinery like in a factory or he was in the merchant marine so there's probably stickers on on the machinery there on the i don't know bombs or whatever but uh they, he had a sticker on his guitar and drawn on his guitar uh, this machine kills fascists taking from probably these other machines that that were uh doing that and so we, we made a bunch of buttons and we've got uh, anti-racism anti-sexism and and uh, rowan came up with that this machine irritates fascists which i think is pretty funny and and occasionally it irritates people and you know it, it's working so uh, uh guaranteed that all right that's all i got for you tonight and uh thanks so much for joining us and listening and i will see you on accordion noir <laughs>